what I realized in scripture as also in my life is that I gained my identity from who my dad was. And I grew up and, and, and going through things, even as a husband, as a father, I'm realizing that I still don't understand my identity. So I began a few years ago searching for who my dad was, trying to figure out who my family was, trying to connect with people because I have these thoughts, I have these things, but I cannot explain why I deal with what I deal with. So I needed something to identify with. This is not all the time a comfortable conversation because uh, there are people who are abused. There are people who are misused. And so your view of an earthly father is not that good. And I, I know it's going to be kind of tough, but I want to end it on a high note because at the end of the day, I believe that we have a great responsibility not to our namesake, but we have a great responsibility to our spiritual recovery. In the scripture, in Romans chapter 8, verse 15, I'll read it from the King James Version. This is where we come from today. It says, for you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Lord, we come to you today, and I simply thank you uh, for the life, the health, the strength, not only for myself, because that's selfish. I thank you for those that are here, that you woke us up, that you gave us strength to come into this place. Although some of us are battle weary, we're still here. Thank you and we honor you with what we have, the substance of our being. Allow this word to now strengthen us and take us where you desire for us to go. Give me wisdom, give me understanding of your word to discern and display your word, to display your glory today so that people may be edified and glorified through you. We honor you today. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. And amen. The biggest challenge that many of us will find, as I said, is finding our identity. It, it, in my 20 years of ministry, uh, I really discovered that this is the case for those who are in church as well as those who are outside of church. Uh, I, I realized in, 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 in later years that some of my identity was false because I was so busy trying to keep up with bishop so-and-so or pastor so-and-thus and trying to keep up with this image and trying to keep up with this clique or this crew. And I rarely knew who I was. And so I can honestly say that at some point, you can agree with me if you want to, I was living a lie. And what I realized is that I, I was not living who God to be who God created me to be, but I was so busy trying to identify with people. If you grew up like I did, my father died when I was 11 years old. And so as far as my identity as a man, I've identified with so many other people. Most of my identity, I'm ashamed to say, came from NWA uh, in, the, in the late 90s, early 90s. I apologize for that. Uh, God is a sovereign God. He's He's, he's able to change anything. If he can change me from sagging and cussing and, and, and fighting, well, you know, he's still working on the other parts, but, you know, he, he's working on it. If he can change me from that, then I'm certain that he can do some amazing things with you. And so I don't come here today to bring a message of doom and gloom, but I bring a message of hope that we all have a father, that although me, we might not uh, want to identify or have the ability to identify with our earthly father, I don't need to waste time on, 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 on trying to figure out who my daddy was or how good he was or how awesome he was because when it all boils down to it, he does not compare to my heavenly father. As much as I love Ron Gunby, as much as I look like Ron Gunby, every time I see somebody say, boy, you look just like your daddy, I say I better or the mailman going to have some explaining to do. For the time that is ours to share, I want to speak from the topic, who's your daddy? Some of that is going to make you smile, and some of it is going to make you think. Three things I want to give you. Three things, and I promise to soon get out of your way. I want to give you so that you understand who your daddy is. The first thing I want you to understand is that there has been redefined sonship. There has been redefined sonship. Verse 14 says this, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Now, that's a defining moment. How can I become a son of God? Ladies, please don't mistake this as saying that you are now men. When God sees you, he created you to be a woman. 
There are things in the word of God. There are things in your life that are going to always separate us. I don't care what society says that you can do this and you can do this and you can do it just like a man. There, there is no equal when it comes to male and female gender except respect and love. Can I say that? The reality of it is we have been created differently. However, the way God sees us is not according to our gender. He sees us according to our spirit because at the end of the day, your gender won't make it into heaven. At the end of the day, when your body takes on immortality, your earth suit will be here and we become sons of God. Now, the scripture says this, for as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are defined as the sons of God. What this in turn says, not only is it a dynamic of who's leading, but it, it leans on our decision to follow. Now, let me say this and let me go ahead and get this out the way. Everybody that come to church ain't going to make it to heaven. Everybody that puts on a suit on a Sunday goes through the traditions of, of what we do at a Sunday service won't make it to heaven. The thing that breaks my heart and my heart has been broken for the last few weeks is because we put so much energy in looking righteous. We put so much energy in acting righteous that we fail to live righteously. And so I'm challenged to help you understand that when your body is laid out before us, you may or may not make it to heaven. Coming to church don't guarantee you. What if you came to church every Sunday and then walked out and started killing folk? You still going to heaven? At the end of the day, there are rules and guidelines according to the word of God that qualify us that's why the word says broad is the way which leads to destruction. But there's a narrow path. Everybody's not going to make the path because people fail to line up with the will and the word of God. I've been questioning all week, just thinking, when I die, will I make it into heaven? When I die, where is my soul going? Does my preaching qualify me? See, my preaching can qualify me, but my life will disqualify me. I can appear righteous before you all, but before my Savior, I can stand there and he can, he can, he can listen to me say, Lord, I preached in your name. I serve the community in your name and he'll look at my heart and he'll say, depart from me because you never gave me your heart. I want us to recognize the power of God, the Holy Trinity as one, but they have three distinct roles that I want to identify today. We have God, the father, He's our covering. He's our protector. He's our creator. There's so many things that I could say about him that time will not permit. But when we see God, he is the one that we ultimately want to worship. Then we have Jesus, who is the son of God. He is, for lack of a better term, he is our connection to the creator. He is our, our lifeline where sin has widened the gap. He is the bridge that takes us over. Now, here's the thing. I can say I know Jesus or I can confirm that I know Jesus because this scripture says, for as many as are led by the third part of the Trinity, the, the Holy Spirit is the comforter. He is the guide. He is the leader. He is the one whom we follow. He, his whole job is not to give you private revelation. The Holy Spirit's job is to not drop something in your spirit so that you river dance. You knew I was going to throw that in. 
so that you, you feel like you have arrived at a certain level so that people will qualify you as spiritual. The Holy Spirit, the Bible says, tells us of things to come. And his responsibility is in telling us of things to come opens our receptors to point us to Christ to connect us and get us across the bridge to the creator. Help me, Lord. John 3, 16, 6, John 16, 13. Write it down. Read it for yourself. It says in the King James Version, how be it when the spirit of truth is come, Listen, he will guide you into all truth for he shall not speak of himself. But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak and he will show you things to come. They that are led by the spirit of God as a scholar is led in his learning by his tutor. As a traveler in his journey is led by a guide. As a soldier is in, in his engagement is led, not driven like beast, not beat, browbeat, told of your sin, told how bad you are so that you feel guilty in coming to God. But the spirit is liberating. The spirit frees you from the sin you possess so that you can go to God with a free heart. The Holy Spirit is like a wave. Last week, I caught the biggest fish. I'm lying in the pulpit. Help me, Jesus. Uh, we went on a fishing trip last uh, Thursday, Friday, and uh, fished all day. Just enjoyed ourselves and relaxed, cleared our minds. And while we were out on the dock uh, Friday afternoon, I noticed people were still in the ocean. It was warm, and there were people on wave boards and and, and surfboards and this is what I realized they were out there waiting on the next wave see the church has a wave every service somebody catch that in a few minutes the church has a wave every time the praise and worship gets up there's a wave not necessarily true you know you can get a wave pool turn the machine on and a wave will, will come but in the ocean the wave never happens the same way you can't come in church and sing three songs and allow the spirit to start from there. If the worship don't start when you open your eyes saying, Lord, thank you for the life you've given me, then you can't come in here and expect the wave. Let me go back to our regular schedule program. What I noticed while standing on the dock watching the surfers who were out there, they were waiting on waves. Now, in the ocean, Waves come in all the time, but they don't come in the same way. And I noted the anticipation of the surfers when they noticed a wave was coming. What they did was they positioned themselves to catch the wave. And before the wave got to them, they began movement. The problem with the church is we're waiting on the Holy Spirit, the wave of his glory to come in, but we haven't pre prepared ourselves. We haven't positioned ourselves. And when the waves come, because we're not ready, it goes right by us. We are sons, ladies and gentlemen. Not because we're so righteous, but because we've decided to be led by the Spirit. And when, 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 when we are sons because we accept the leadership of the Holy Spirit, and, and, and that ability gives us the, the opportunity to reconnect us to the Creator by the way of Jesus the Christ. Not only in, in understanding who your daddy, do you have to redefine sonship, but secondly, you got to review the release. You got to review the release. For as may, for you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry abba father. Let's look at bondage versus adoption. And, and I want you to understand this that that what we see God as, the father, the creator Technically, we base our view of God 
based on the relationship of our earthly fathers. I say it like this. My relationship with my dad was very good. My father loved me. He took care of me. But my father had a big mouth. He didn't know how to whisper. You know, his, his gentleness was, hey, go sit down. That's gentle. So the way I was raised was I loved my father. My father loved me, but it was mostly or predominantly a fear-based relationship. My dad was not mean, but he meant what he said. Six foot seven, 300 plus pounds. It's not a small dude. Whatever he said went. Whether you liked it or not. If I got a whooping, everybody got a whooping. Okay, it wasn't just my house. Okay. But I grew up. And when I, when I developed my relationship with God, that transition from my earthly father to my heavenly father. We've all said this at some point of stage in our lives. Don't mess up because God going to strike you down. Right? And we developed this fear of God that we could never do right in his eyes and all he wanted to do was love us. But it wasn't his perception. It was our perception that tainted the whole view. I want, I want to paint a picture for you. Let's look at this process of, of bondage and adoption. And in looking at this process, I want, to, I want to talk about there is an exchange that nobody talks about in the scriptures. There's an exchange that happened that we get to Easter and we mention it, then we go to the crux of the story. But there was an exchange that happened on our behalf that we really don't pay it any attention. In, 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 in the book of, uh, in, in the four gospels, it mentions Barabbas. You know Barabbas. Barabbas was the, 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 this prisoner who was eventually let go. And, and once a year, Pilate had the authority to commute a sentence of one prisoner to another. And at this time, during the Passover, here the Jews have now captured Jesus. This is the night after the, uh, the, the, the Last Supper, after the Garden of Gethsemane, when he was taken in, and now he's prisoner by the Jews. And the Jews are saying, we want him crucified. And Pilate is saying, I see that this man has done nothing wrong. And so here we have, he said, I'm going to give you the responsibility because I'm going to basically wash my hands of the whole situation and he said he said I'm going to give you a prisoner to release you either want to release Jesus or you want to release Barabbas now come to find out Barabbas actual name was Jesus Barabbas you study it for yourself. I want to help you understand some things now the word or the name Barabbas has been Hellenized that don't mean it came from hell. It means that there is a, a dialect that has combined the name. Now, I want to take you into something. I'm going to come back to Barabbas. You have Simon, son of John. In the Bible, they call him Simon Barjona. Bar means son of. I want to paint a picture. Now, let's go back to Barabbas and switch it out. Jesus Barabbas. Jesus, son of, now we just read in the scripture that says Abba means father. But this is in a plural sense. I did my research trying to figure out which tribe because I understand now Barabbas was, was Jewish because he fell under the custom wherewith he could be let go according to their custom. And at the end of the day, his name was Jesus, son of the father's. When you talk about the Jews, they always mention the fathers. God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and, and the God of Jacob. In, in, in Jesus, Barabbas, you have Jesus, the son of the earthly fathers. But there was a fair exchange, and this is what we have to understand about this, this adoption process. We've been brought in and Jesus, our sentence has been commuted over to Christ. Whereas we really owe the penalty of death. You and I should be dead on a cross 
Barabbas' penalty was to be crucified. And Jesus, who knew no sin, had been beat all night. Pilate said, go beat him and handle that. I washed my hands of it. But this is what I want you to read. The crowd chose Barabbas to be released. Jesus Barabbas, Jesus, son of the fathers, they wanted him to be released. And Jesus, the son of God, to be crucified. A passage found only in the gospel of Matthew says these words. Let the blood be on us and our children. Sometimes we do the will of God and don't know it's the will of God. Luke chapter 3. Write it down. I'm going to go through it real quick. 22, 21 to 22 from the Message Bible. It says, after all the people, people still doubt if Jesus was the Son of God. People still doubt. But it appears in Scripture, and you have to realize that there were scribes who went everywhere writing down everything. And in Scripture, at Jesus' baptism, it was documented. After all the people were baptized, Jesus was baptized. And he was praying, as he was praying, the sky opened. And the Holy Spirit, like a dove descending, came down on him. Along with the Spirit, a voice said, people heard the voice. This is my son. He's been marked and chosen by my love. He's the pride of my life. King James Version says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. You think that was enough? No. When, when Peter, James, and John went up with Jesus to the Mount of Transfiguration, when Moses and Elijah appeared, it says in Matthew 17, write it down. Verse 5, it says, While he was going on like this babbling, a light radiant cloud enveloped him, and sounding deep from the cloud, a voice says, This is my beloved son. Focus on him, hear him, follow him. God is identifying not Doug as his beloved son, but Jesus as his beloved son. And because Jesus was foretold and fulfilled what was foretold, then I can be accepted in the beloved through the process of adoption. When uncovering who's your daddy, not only do you have redefined sonship, and you must review the release. But lastly, you have a relationship confirmation. This is what I need more than anything. When I turned 30, I began to be frightful of living. My dad died at 36. I started going through these. Huh, man, I started feeling weary. I got around 33 and it got worse. I started drinking cranberry juice. My dad died of kidney failure, so... I ain't want bad kidneys, so I just drank cranberry juice. That's like mental stuff just going on. The, oh, the closer I got, the worse it got. 38 now. I surpassed my dad's life by two years. You know why? Because I'm not him. I didn't live the life he lived. I, didn't, I wasn't susceptible to the same faults that he was. They came. They presented themselves. And as I'm saying that, I want you to say that about your own life. You've surpassed some, some benchmarks that you weren't supposed to. You've surpassed some places that you weren't supposed to. And that's all because, not because of who your mom and your daddy was and they were so righteous, but your father confirmed your relationship with him. And it says the spirit itself bears witness with our spirit. That we are the children of God. All the children of God in here stay seated. All the children of God stay seated. Confuse a couple of them, but we got your back. And the Bible says, and if we're children, then we're heirs. Heirs of God. And join as with Christ is so that we suffer with him. 
that we may also be glorified with him. I love the wording of this passage. It, it, it dispels the continual, it brings about the discontinuation of the outsider mentality. I don't know if you've ever understood what an adoption process is like, but for the most part, the child that has been adopted never really feels a part of the family initially. That, that child will come in and, and ask permission to go to their room because they really don't feel a part of the family. The family is not doing anything to make them feel not a part. It's just they have to recondition their mind. We spend so much time in church asking God for stuff he's already set aside for us. God bless me with a house. He's your daddy. He's your father. My God has supplied all my needs. I don't have to ask him for that. I don't have to spin my wheels saying, God, bless me indeed. My children don't have to ask me for a thing because they're my children and I pay attention to them. I know what they need. That's the word. Even before they ask me. When they come ask, I just kind of smile on the inside like I knew you was coming. God does the same thing. He knows what you have need of before you ask. So don't waste your energy asking him for what he's already going to provide for you. Spend your energy developing your relationship with him. Not that he know you, but you get to know him. This, this text confirms our relationship with God the Father, through Jesus Christ, by way of the Holy Spirit, not in the transformation of the outward appearance. Let me help you understand something. This suit is only on my body because that's what you're comfortable in seeing preachers in. If a preacher stood up here with shorts on, you will find another church that's sacrilegious. Because you built your relationship on building the outward appearance and trying to impress people by looking the part. This does not qualify my salvation. It's not through the traditions that we set through religious activity. Religious activity is I'm going to get up. I'm going to complain. Now I get up for work. I get up for ball games and for church. I'm going to get there because pastor not going to get up until. And we set these religious schedules. And it qualifies us in our own mind to be righteous. These religious activities don't connect you. Sitting in here don't connect you. You can watch on YouTube. It's free. What connects you is the internal connection of the spirit. They that are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. The Spirit itself bears witness. Here's the adoptive process of man. I'm going to get out of your way. The adoptive process of man, there are always legal issues that have to be addressed. Remember that. Legal issues have to be addressed. There are also notifications that have to be made. Whenever you're going to adopt somebody, they have to be put in a newspaper. It has to be put in some type of media for a time span. The third thing is a time span. There's going to have to be a time span in order for notifications to be put out so that the legal issues can all be taken care of. That's the adoptive process according to man. But let me help you with the adoptive process according to my father. If you're coming into his family and you're building a relationship with him, I need you to understand that the legal issues, the legalities of the law have already been addressed. Understand this. This is the purpose of the law. The law is simply a tutor. It says in Galatians 3, 24, write it down. Galatians 3, 24. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, not to church. The law was a tutor to bring us to Christ, 
that we might be justified by our faith, by our trust in him. Secondly, it revealed what sin was. Romans 7, verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. The law is the mirror to ourselves which helps us to recognize where our sins are. Secondly, notifications have already been made. Jesus said these words, Think not that I have come to destroy the law, but I came to fulfill the law, where the law was always going to come up short. 633 different laws, you never would meet them all. So you would always find yourself in sin. The law did not, did, uh, did not define your permanent space in heaven. It was Jesus and the sacrifice on the cross which allows our names to be put in the Lamb's book of life. The purpose, John 3, 16. I read it from the Message Bible. This is how much God loved the world. He gave his son, his one and only son, and, and this is why, so that there be, so there be no need to be destroyed. By believing in him, anyone could have whole and everlasting life. God didn't go all through all the trouble of sending his son to merely point an accusing finger at us, telling the world how bad we are. He came to help to put the world right again, and anyone who trusts in him is acquitted of their sins. Talked about predestination, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4 and 5. Write it down. Study for yourself. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. And lastly, the time span. The time span is defined in Matthew 24 and verse 36. But of that day, the Bible simply says, Jesus said, that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but Abba, my father, is the only one who knows. So we're in a place that we're in the adoption process. We've been accepted. We've been brought in. And the adoption process is not when your new parents sign the papers. The adoption process comes into fruition when you receive the adoption. The problem is we're living in a new house. The problem is we have a parent, a father that loves us, but we are not comfortable with calling him daddy. We're not comfortable with being comfortable around our father. You have to understand this. Your father loves you. Your father won't treat you maybe like your earthly father did. I heard a story where a father abused his own daughter and to punish her for doing wrong would tie a belt around her neck and hang her till she got to her last breath and then let her go. What kind of love is that? Abuse ain't love. When I put my hands on my children, it's to bring them close to my heart, to let them know, even though you don't do everything perfect, even though you don't do everything right, I'll never stop loving you. Let me help you understand something simply. We all have a father. I'm not talking about Ron Gumby or whoever your earthly father is. We all have a father. I charge you, get to know your daddy. Get to know your father, not for what he can give to you, but what you can receive from him. That's the undying love, the compassion, the care, the, 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 the hope for a future. When I die, I stand here today in full confidence that I've been acquitted of all my sins, that I'm being made righteous in his sight, 
And when I die, it won't be no questions as to whether or not I'll be in heaven because I've decided to receive this adoption. I've decided that I love living in his house. I've decided that he is my daddy and I'm in his will. I'm in his life. I'm in his line. And whatever he's lined up for my life, I'm willing to do because he's my daddy. So who's your daddy? Father, I bless you. I simply thank you for your word. More importantly, I thank you, God, for being my dad. I know what it's like to be without. I know what it's like to live longing, hoping. I know what it's like to be lifeless. I know what it's like to be destitute. I know what it's like to want to end it all. God, I thank you. I simply thank you for forgiveness. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you for your passion for me. Even though I'm, I'm just getting to a place where I develop this passion and this desire to serve you. I thank you. More than just for me, God. I pray for my brothers. I pray for my sisters. That today be the day that we open our eyes to be led by your spirit to be called your sons, to be released, to be adopted, and to receive your adoption. Thank you for your blood. Thank you for the sacrifice. Thank you that we're now joint heirs, not to rule over, but to reign with. I honor you today. It's in Jesus' name.